Well, take your turn in Bible with me. I don't know how many of y'all are listening this morning. I want to make sure I dot all my T's and cross all my I's, you know? I don't know if how carefully you're listening, how carefully you are listening, but um, over to Revelation to John, the Lord's Revelation to John, really the Lord's Revelation to the world, is what he's telling of. You know, there's, there's two revelations of God, I think, as we... I can't remember what I thought of and what I said last Sunday, so I'm sorry if you hear things more than once, but if you're like me, you probably have to hear them about 20 times in order to retain them. So if I don't know what I said last Sunday, I seriously doubt many of you do as well. But, uh, you know, there's two... There's really two ways that the Lord will reveal Himself to the world. There's, there's a way that's happening right now. He told them in John 16, He says, It's expedient or it's better for you if I go to the Father. He said, Because if I go to the Father, I will send the Helper, the Comforter, and when he has come, you know, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he said when he's come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And y'all probably remember, he went on to explain of sin because they believe not in me, of, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And at the time at least for those 12 and so many of other others around them, they had this empirical evidence of the righteousness of Christ. He says, the works I do, they speak of my righteousness, right? They, and he says, but I'm going to the Father and you'll see me no more, and so you'll need the Holy Spirit to con convict you or to convince you of, of my righteousness. And they had this empirical evidence, and poor Thomas, he was so used to it that after the resurrection and he got, he wasn't, you know, on the road to Emmaus, and he didn't happen to be among the first uh, appearances of Christ, and, and he had to open his mouth, and he said, no, nope, uh-uh, unless I get the touch of my finger. I won't believe. And so Jesus, you know, pops on the scene. Oh, hey, Tommy. By the way, here you go, you know. And, of course, you know, Thomas, my Lord and my God, and at that point, I don't think he felt so, you know, that he needed to really touch physically. But, but there, there, was, there was a revelation of Christ to Thomas and, and to those who were there that evening and to those who were on the road to Emmaus and, and to all whom he appeared before his ascension. But we're living in, a, in an age because what did he tell Thomas? He said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And I don't know if, if you realize, if you're in Christ and you have believed on Him for salvation, the golden gem that you have, because Jesus said, Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And do you realize that we have faith in a Lord whom we have not seen with our eyes? I'm not saying you haven't seen Him work and move and intervene and, and do those sort of things, but... but there's a, this church age that we live in. Some people don't like that term, church age. Well, anyway, whatever you like. From the time he ascended to the time he's going to return and he's going to touch down on Mount of Olives like some, you know, uh, you, you think we got all these anime characters these days and I, I watch them and the things, they like come down and, you know, and all this stuff, you know, flying and, you know, these illustrations of power and might and, and flashing and all this, but you know, there's there's a time. There's, we're going through this period of time when he has not returned to the earth. He ascended, and y'all remember there, you know, they poor guys. God caught him in a in a humorous moment as they watched him ascend, and they were just in awe and wonder. And a couple angels come along, and what? What are you bozos looking at, man? Like, what are y'all? What are y'all doing, staring up in the sky like this? He said, "Don't you know that he'll come in like fashion, and he's going to return?" And 
And there's two ways for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed to you. One is through His Spirit, and that's how the Father draws people to Himself. The other revelation of Jesus Christ is something much more severe. And that's what we are going to be studying, you know, in this revelation of Jesus Christ, that He will be revealed to the world, but not in very gracious and salvific terms. He'll be coming as a judge and as a king and as a ruler and in all those ways. And so how important it is in this time, in this age, to to believe on Him by faith because the time is coming when He will be revealed to the world in in a much different way. And looking this morning... There's the church at Smyrna. Somewhere in here, the church at Pergamum, I believe, is where we left off. In uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Getting to that point in him warning and sending letters to his churches and his church overall. Still today, we read this. And if you notice in the, in the bulletin, it's uh, trying to learn the things that are pleasing to the Lord, part 3. Like why do we why do we study this stuff? You know, why do we study the Israelites? Well, to learn how they y'all remember the drill sergeant illustration. It, we did not have to be rocket scientists. If the drill sergeant was mad with that guy because he had, you know, his patch on or his boots on in a certain way, we didn't need anybody to explain it to us. We were running around the corner getting our stuff right before the wrath of the drill sergeant came upon us. And we said, oh, man, I'm so glad old so-and-so got a farmer. I remember farm. We had two guys, farmer and spangler. And those two guys were so messed up in boot camp, I'm telling you, they were like the sacrificial lamb for us. You know, the drill sergeants were on them so much, every time that we'd see them mess something up, we're like, okay, drill sergeant doesn't like that. We're not going to do that. In the same way, we read through these churches and almost every one, except for that second one, right? Except for, except for Smyrna, that horribly persecuted church. He has, I got this thing against you. I don't like this about what you're doing. And we need to learn from these things. Now, I learned as a young boy growing up on a ranch with cows and goats and horses and chickens and dogs and and all these things and they're not that different than people you know by the way but I learned with my dog first that I could come alongside my dog and I'd kind of push and that dog would push back and I'd push a little more and that dog would push back and I'd push a little more and that dog would push back and then I thought you know what would be funny so I get over there and I, I push and I push and I push and all of a sudden I like move and push him from the other side and the dog falls over and I was like, oh, that was great, you know. And I learned you could do it with horses too. You know, we'd be saddling horses and they'd be too close together and we, you try to push a horse over and he's 1,200 pounds going, whatever, dude, you know, you're not pushing me. So, oh, so I learned. I'd grab a hold of that latigo. That's the thing that ties the cinch, you know, tightens it up. And I'd lean back and I'd pull and that horse would just, and I'd pull on it and I'd pull and then all of a sudden I'd shove that horse over and, you know, and that horse would like stumble over to the side. I was like, oh, I got you. I got you. You know, the devil is the same way with us. He will flip things on us. He will get us to resist him in a certain way. And then he'll turn around and flip it around on us and hit us from a completely different angle that we weren't ready for, we weren't prepared for. And look, you'll remember Smyrna. What was Smyrna? Smyrna was the horribly persecuted church. Y'all remember from around 100 to 312 A.D. that there was just this time when, you know, there was emperor cults and the worship of the emperor and of, of Roma. You know, that was the the goddess, you know, uh, embodiment of, of Rome in a, in a female fashion, if you will. And, and they were just horribly persecuted and persecuted and persecuted. And you know what happened? The church grew and it grew and it grew, just like it happened in China. And you're like, well, how does that work? Well, God's greater, right, than the persecution of man. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, but the, the Lord can still overcome. And, and so I really believe, if you had to ask me, that the devil changed the strategy around 300. Because we read here, look in verse 12, chapter 2. He says, 
and to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, and even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. It says, thus you, have all, thus you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Let's pray. Father, give grace unto us, Lord, through the teaching of your word, through him, imperfect mediums, God, like us. But by grace, Lord, I pray that I might be a conduit for your word and a word of edification or correction or instruction or reproof and or whatever it may be, Lord, that your church needs. Father, here you said not just any white stone, but a stone with a name written on it, God. And we're not only an aggregate to you, Lord, we are personal. And I pray that you'd speak to us in a very personal way, God, individually, as we need to hear from you. Father, we look unto you and, and in your word for our needs in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I remember as a kid learning a little cliche from, y'all would watch, ever watch Looney Tunes and, and, uh, you know, two guys go to get, go at it, you know, like Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny. And, of course, Bugs Bunny was so cool, he'd always win and come out on top. And, and every once in a while, you'd see a Looney Tunes where at the very end, you know, the antagonist, the loser, poor Daffy Duck or whoever it was, you know, he just changes what he's doing and he goes and starts hanging around with Bugs Bunny. And what, y'all remember what he said? If you can't beat him, join him. And I, I was a little kid, and I remember hearing that going, oh, if you can't beat them, join them. And uh, perhaps that could be used in a good context, and perhaps it could be used in an evil context. But if you ask me what happened, what happened around, you know, in the church around 300 A.D., I can tell you what I believe happened. I believe that the devil tried his very best for two centuries to stamp out this thing that caught wildfire and grew like crazy and it didn't matter how much he inspired those Caesars to persecute and to hurt and it didn't matter how much he just indoctrinated the world to hate Christians that he just could not by persecution and by pain and suffering, stamp out the fire that was in the church. So you know what? Instead of beating him, he just joined him. He pushed so hard from one way for 200 years, and when he realized that that church wasn't going to budge, he <laughs> jumped to the side and gave a quick shove from the opposite side. And he took the church from great suffering into great prosperity, from fear and from you know, having no rights and no recognition in the public world to, to having all these things, and in fact, becoming the superiors of the society. And he did it through a man named Constantine. And it's pretty amazing how it all happens. And you saw what he wrote to them. He said... Uh, he said, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this. Do you all notice that he describes himself differently to every church? Isn't that interesting how the Lord describes himself just differently? He, what did he say back in the beginning of chapter 2 to Ephesus? He says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. What is that? That would be intimacy. 
you know, near unto the Lord in the Lord's hand and close by, you know, I'm the one who has you in my hand. And the thing, what the thing that they needed, what was intimacy? Hey, you've lost your first love. I've got you in my right hand, but you're prickly and pointy, you know, All right? You're unpleasant, you know, whatever it may be. And then to Smyrna, what did he say? He said to Smyrna, he says, uh, you know, the one who was dead and has come to life says this. Why did he describe himself that way? Because they needed life. Theirs was, they were condemned publicly. They were doomed that if they had not been killed already, they were going to be killed. And they knew that life expectancy for a Christian wasn't so great. What did they need? They needed life, you know. And then here we come to Pergamum. And what does he tell them? <clears throat> he says, the one who has a two, uh, sharp two-edged sword. you all remember what God says about that two-edged sword, how he describes it in Hebrews. He said that the word of God is, you know, alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it divides asunder, and there's a little bit of, of doctor talk in there, what the joints and the marrow, you know, and the marrow, and not only that, but he says it's also a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of man. And that's what they needed. They needed discernment. They needed wisdom because, you know, a great sales pitch came along and they bought it hook, line, and sinker and they did not realize, you know, what, what was involved and what it would do to the church. You know, I'm sure everybody there thought it was absolutely wonderful that persecution was coming to an end. But they didn't realize the effect that it would have. In the church, he said, you know, that uh, he says, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, I think it was Tertullian that told us that Antipas, that he was, he was fried. He was dumped in a hot vat of, of uh, grease. And uh, so, I mean, if, you know, he kind of gives you an idea. And, and um, Pergamos was... Also, you know, one, one side of the city was kind of a pretty steep rise, like a thousand feet. And then on top of that rise was uh, a huge statue thrown to Zeus. Was, and it was 150 feet tall. And, you know, but there was definitely some intense idol worship there in that city that was going on. <clears throat> but he said in verse 14, he says, I have a few things against you because. Why? He says that there's some there that hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. You see, it wasn't what, you know, and I don't know if y'all remember, I think that's like back there around Numbers chapter 20, something like that. If you remember when the Israelites were coming through and they were coming close by Moab and, and the king went out there to, to uh, this prophet Balaam, not a Christian prophet, a, a seer, a soothsayer, you know, a, a, a wizard, if you will, this kind of guy. And he went out there and he said, I, I need you to curse this nation Israel. He said, okay, I'm good to curse, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, you, price is right, I'll start cursing. And he went and instead of cursing, he blessed Oh, he said, well, you know, you don't get it. You know, God is not letting me curse. He's, he's causing me to bless. And the king said, you idiot, I told you to curse and you bless. You know, let's try it again. And he asked him to curse and he blessed again and, he, and they did it three times. And the king's like, I don't need any more help like this. <laughs> and, and so, and it was, and Balaam just said, I just can't do it. But Balaam came, Balaam came back and he said, uh, hey, he said, you know, there, there's another way. He said, you don't have to get me to curse them. They'll curse themselves. You just need to change their situation. You know, there was, there was no exogenous force, no external force that, that cursed that early persecuted church and brought them down. They weren't taken down by the outside. Right? They were... They were they were there and they were being crushed and beaten and bruised and killed and all the, and they and they had all this if you will forces from the outside of the church right cursing them and and penalizing them and beating them up but it didn't it didn't stamp out the church in fact it just 
really put the signature of authenticity on it for everybody watching to know, man, these Christians really have something. But how did the church change? It, it, it became corrupted internally. What did, what did Balaam tell Balak, right? He said, no, no, no. He said, there's another way. There's another way. You don't, it doesn't have to be from me I'm on top of a hill. He said, all you need to do is to get these good-looking Moabite women to put on their eyeliner. And, I'm, yeah, seriously, you know. He said, uh, send them down there in a pretty dress with a belly dance and make sure they take their little astro off there so when they go off into the woods to do their number, you know, and he says, man, he said, you'll corrupt them from the inside out. That's what you can do. And, you know, like, what is that teaching of Balaam? You know, and what did he do? And that's it's the very thing that they did. They did not, they didn't defeat the Israelites with the curse. They corrupted the Israelites through the lust of their own heart, just like James tells us. That's how sin happens, right? You know, there's a lust and conception is made and you, you make the deal and you do the dirty deed and you feel like it afterwards. And, you know, so and that's what they did. They, the, the Moabite women enticed the men of Israel. And, of course, you know, Astroth worship was, was the thing among the Moabites. And, and they got drug into that and they were corrupted through that very thing. And I don't know if you know the history and what happened, but I think it was in 312. There was warring going on. There was fighting that was happening. And Constantine made a claim that he had a vision. He might very well have had a vision. Whether it was from God or not, I, that I don't know. You know, if you think that the devil can't give visions too, well, think again. He could probably give you quite the apparition and quite, you know, quite the uh, inspiration, if you will. But Constantine, and I don't know if I remember it correctly and wonderfully, Daniel, Daniel could probably tell me. Daniel knows history a lot better than I do. But I believe he said something along the lines that he had a vision and he looked up in the sky and he saw a cross and he heard the command in my name or in, in this, go and conquer. And so Constantine ap appealed to the masses and he said, no. He said, I'm supposed to conquer in the name of Christ. And so enter in the, the inspiration for the crusade ideas, right? And so Constantine, what he flipped everything around and he said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm Christian. And by the way, we're a Christian nation. And by the way, you know, by law, you have to have your baby, you know, to be a Christian and baptized and to go all the, through all those things. And, and you, so you see how things flipped so dramatically. And the government went, government went from telling people they couldn't be Christian to telling people that they had to be Christian. And so now Christianity and the state were one. And, you know, and that's... And, and, you know, the sad thing is, is the Christians, by and large, accepted it. You know why? Because they were no longer being persecuted. It was easier. I mean, it was, and, and I don't blame them. I, I, I'm not trying to criticize them. It's, it's natural. I don't even know anything about that kind of persecution, and I got problems. You know what I mean? So, so it, it makes sense. I mean, there's a reason why Paul described it as the wiles of the devil. But do you know the devil will get you like that? If he can't get you with poverty, he'll make you rich. If he can't get you with loneliness, he'll make you so popular and famous. You know what I mean? Like, he will get you one way or another, and he gets you to where you are set in one way and accustomed to something in one, one particular way, and then he'll turn things around and put things in a different situation in a way that you weren't prepared for. You know, he dials up things according to individuals. He makes some people rich because that's where they'll never choose God. He makes some people poor because that's where they'll, they will never choose God. He finds out what you need to keep you away from God, and that's what he works to give you in your life. You know, some of us wonder why we don't have more money. You ever think that it might corrupt you horribly? Oh, no. No, yeah. Right? You know, go study winners of the lottery. Go, go. I mean, there, there's good study research studies that have been done and uh, observe friends and family that get large amounts of inheritance and see what it does to people 
You know, to, we watch people, I've known people that have gone to prison and been in prison for years and done so wonderfully in prison and they've done so well and they study and they teach scripture and they, they have their life so in order and they get out of prison and things go bonkers. Why? They have this freedom. They have a different situation. I believe that that's what happened in Pergamum. I believe that's what happened in this era. You know, the church went from, from one condition to such a dramatic, different condition, and we very much in the same way need to watch out for those kind of things in our life. But what did they did? He said he inspired them, right, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of, of immorality. It was, was the inspiration that was there. And so this is the beginning of, of papacy. And the rise to papacy in the, in the direction towards uh, Roman Catholicism and what happened in the church there. And, and all of a sudden, government saw what it did for Constantine because immediately he had millions of people that were, yay, Constantine. He won the affection of the church. And so the devil just politically manipulated the Christian church in order to infiltrate and to corrupt them and Y'all think that still happens today? You suppose any politicians in the last 50 years have gotten up there, really not caring about the things of the Lord, not having a prayer life, not even being redeemed themselves, and get up there and spout off a bunch of conservative stuff that they know the Christians will love because Christians will support them? You, you would think that this would have been the salvation of the church. But it was really the demise. I don't want to say demise because the church still is. There's a remnant. But it was a downfall. It was a backsliding of the church. But don't y'all know that we still have this problem today? Don't y'all remember how much in the last 8 or 12 years conservative Christians have been saying, boy, if we could just get our man in office, then what? Then what? You know what that's like? That's like having a vehicle that's an absolute piece of junk. Four bald tires, the suspension is bad, the ball joints are out, you know, your alternator's out, your power steering pump is, is whining, you know, like, you know, you know, and everything's messed up. You, it burns oil as much as it does gas. You know, this whole truck, you know, air conditioner doesn't work. That's a problem in a couple months, right? You know, all those things. But, you know, and then to say, man, you know, if I could just replace my ECM, Electronic control module. Ah, oh boy, if I could get a good, fresh computer in that vehicle, we'd be on the track to recovery. Oh, no, not at all. What makes you think that if we, even if you could find, you know, a Billy Graham figure to put in the presidency, is that going to transform the hearts of the people? Yeah, it's just not. It'd be like having a, a derelict dressed so out of whack and so messed up and you fix his hair and you say, look, he's, he's restored. What foolishness is it to think? You know, the only thing we do by our Christian vote is we mitigate the degradation of our culture. That's the only thing we do. You know, and even if we could get a very ideal, God-fearing Christian man or woman into that office or whatever offices that we might want to pick, you know the Americans are still the Americans that they are. We think that the filth and corruption is like only up there in the office. No, it's the people. It's the people just the same. But the foolishness, right? And it's been going on and on and on. Oh, there was a conservative coalition. There was the moral majority, right? There was, uh, well, what was the other? Republicanism. Y'all know in the last few years, our conservative crowd got together in massive stadiums and chanted out the F word to our president. Is that remotely Christian? Oh, but then they made it into a euphemism. Let's go Brandon. And that made it okay, so Christians adopt that. And everybody knows it's okay to use a euphemism for F Joe Biden. You realize that we're rotten, like from the inside out. It's, a, it's not a problem with our... But, but nevertheless, that was what they went for here. Oh, man, the president, the, the emperor, he's going to save us. No, he's not going to save you. He's probably going to manipulate you and use you, you know, is what he's going to do. 
is likely what he's going to do. I'm not saying not to be careful the way you vote and evaluate the candidates, but I'm saying that is not our salva salvation. That's our mitigation against abortion. That's our mitigation against, you know, the promotion of all kinds of ungodly things like changing the sex of young kids. I mean, that, that's what we do. That, it's not our salvation. That's not our hope. You know, you, we've got to abandon that idea like, oh, if we could just get... No, you know, if we could get the church to repent and to cry out to God and to get on their knees. And I think it was Adrian Rogers, he said, listen, he says, the revival will never come through the White House. It's always the church house. You know, it's the church house. Otherwise, if it did, we'd have to give praise to Donald Trump or whatever the next conservative leader there is. You know, but, but that's the thing, and that's the thing that it deceived them. Oh, this will be great. It turned out to be worse than ever. It turned out to be horrible, is what it turned out to be. He says, in verse 15, he says, Thus you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And what is that? That's, that's a need for another mediator. You know, that it, it's not you in Christ to enter into the holies. It's you and a priest to get to Christ. Or, you know, that you need somebody to to remit your confession, or you need somebody to give you the sacraments, or something like that. I was visiting with a young man who happened to, happens to be a very devout Catholic, and, um, and I really appreciate that because he was actually able to explain to me what, what he believes, which I have a hard time finding you know, anybody of a Catholic faith to, that can really explain to me intricacies of their belief but rather than the, the practice of their tradition but um but you know we we went over these things and and the very you know that issue of sacred dotalism you know well there's the sacraments and you have to have the sacraments you know well is that just enough can i do the sacraments at home uh, in my own way you know uh, in, a, in a calvary chapel way? oh no 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 you have to have the sacraments given through a particular church or priest and and you know i'm not trying to harp on catholics for being sacerdotal there's other groups that are sacerdotal you know pastor carrie and david came from groups that if you weren't in their group you weren't in i mean you just can't be saved if you're not in a particular group or somebody like that but listen the only restriction on salvation is the lord jesus christ and through him and through him alone and there's there's no one else you know, there, there was, <laughs> you know, it's just directly to the source. But he said he did not like that. And what did he say in verse 16? Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. And that was his prescription. Repent, repent, repent. I don't know if any of y'all have really... I have no doubt that the Lord tells every Christian that sooner or later. But some Christians have never heard that. Well, do you think you need to repent of something? Oh, no. I don't know. I mean, I don't even, I can think of things I need to repent of when God's not even convicting me to repent of them, if you know what I mean. Like, like uh, repentance is not hard. I don't have to go looking carefully. You know, I can find it very easily. It's like, well, there's this, there's that. I could do better there, you know. And, but, you know, that's, that's something that's really very often missing. But it's a thing that we really don't like. You know, repent was his prescription given to them. Stop doing it. Turn around. Go a different way. You know, pick what he wants you to do and do that instead. And he told them, he said, let he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says, to him who overcomes. Well, here's that other statement he gives to people. Uh, he said to, to them, he said, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. Some of the hidden manna, right? Because there was apparent manna flying all over the place, if you will. Oh, yeah, Jesus is Jesus. You know, we have that today. We have apparent manna and we have hidden manna. You know, what do I mean? I, manna being a representation of Christ. You know, oh, do you have Jesus? Oh, yeah, I have Jesus. You know, everybody has Jesus. You know, I, I got Jesus when I went to church camp and I was 16. And are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. You know, they're a Christian. Everybody's a Christian. And if you, if you spend time evangel evangelizing, like out in the Bible Belt, like in these towns like Stephenville and Cleburne and, and down in Waxahachie, and, and you go out there and there's such a familiarity with Christ, you know, everybody's under the impression that, you know, that manna for all, but it's really a false manna. 
and it, it's a fake manna, but then you run across people and, and you speak to them and you find out, wait, no, no, this person no, knows and understands something. <laughs> and there's something different and they have something in Christ that, that the masses don't. What is that? That's, that's that hidden manna. That's that authentic relationship among so much falsehood. That true thing, that that secret that God reveals to you. I don't I don't know. I, I've told y'all before, I'm in my testimony, I you know, when I was twenty one years old, I flipped open a book of testimonies. And I read through the first one and it talked about how God changed their life. I thought that's weird. And I read through the second one. They said it's also about something how God changed their life. And I thought, what? You know, I read through the third, and I went fourth, and, and I remember I, I got to the one with Tom Landry, you know, the, the guy who used to be the coach here for the Dallas Cowboys, and, and he talked also about how God changed his life, and I said, what are these people talking about? I'm a Christian, and God never changed my life. What are they talking about? I don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about some hidden manna. They're talking about in a, in a place, in a world like in this time when it was such a, a familiarity of Christianity and oh yeah, everybody's a Christian. Why? Because it's the, it's the Roman law. Don't you know? How did you become a Christian? Well, you know, when I was a baby, they followed the law. They followed Constantine's law. They had to baptize me when I was a baby and I became a, I became a Christian. You know, and you're like, that's fake manna. That's not the real deal. You're missing out on something. And then those people go along just like I did, and they have a real encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit convicts them, and they realize, oh, this, this is the real manna. This is the real deal. And he said, to those who overcome, he'll give the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. I don't know if you all know about the, the casting of ballots, and they, they did this for votes, and they also did this for... Um, uh, what is it called? Convictions, criminal convictions. And if, you know, uh, they went around to the jury, and the jury could vote with stones, a white stone or a black stone. This goes way back into ancient times. In fact, there was the, the Thummim and the Urim that the Israelites had also, you know, thought to have those two stones, the yes and the no, the white and the black, and, and they casted votes like this. You know, hey, we need to vote on this. You know, what do you do? And cast your ballot. And they would put either a black stone or a white stone into a box. But, but Jesus says, well, I'll give you the white stone of confirmation. I'll give you the white stone of appro approval. I'll give you the white stone of exoneration. And you think, oh, that's great, you know. And he's got a lot of white stones he's passing out, you know, like candy to everybody. No, 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 it's, it's not that generic. You're more important to that you know, than that. And he just didn't say, yeah, I'll give you a white stone and you're good. He said, no, no, no. It's something better. He says, and he says, and a new name written on the stone. I, I don't know. I know to the government I'm a number. You have a social security number, right? You're da, 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 da. I remember the military, I was a number. I had my, my number that I had to have memorized. I think to a lot of these corporations and businesses, you go in there and you're, you're a number. And there's something generic, you know, given to you, boom, boom, bam, uh, you know, here you go, and through the door and out the door and, and away you go. And, you know, God is not like that. He hasn't, like, mass-produced salvation in some, you know, blind, ignorant fashion where, you know, He marches the sheep through in, in huge, you know, numbers, and if you're in, you're in. And, you no, know, you realize he's, he's, he's so intimate about that that He bothers to write things down like this. And He's like, listen, it's not a bunch of just random white stones I'm passing out to everybody. This one has your name on it. That means something more. What if I wrote a bunch of wonderful love songs to just some beautiful woman at random? And I sang them, you know, and, you know, and Jennifer might start to, she's like, hey, why, don't, why don't you assign a name to that? So, <laughs> you know, uh, these other women out here don't need to be wondering who you're talking about. Why don't you make it personal? Why don't you make it exact? And, and say who that beloved woman is with some specificity. And, and that's the very thing that God does. And, and I think that's really valuable to us in our darkest and hardest and most troubling times because there is a time when you wonder, God, are you paying attention? Do you see? Have you forgotten? 
you know, are you? And he's like, man, I, I got your stone, and I even got your name written on that stone. I'm not confused about it. Hey, you know, that there is a belonging there, in so much, you know, a customized belonging. And he says, but no one knows who receives it. That secret, intimate pet name, if you will. He gave one to the Lord, too. Remember that nobody knows except for him. And uh, very specific and personal. And, you know, that hidden manna, it's hidden from who? Who is it hidden from? It's a, it's a good question to ask, and it's not hard. It's really a little bit heartbreaking. You go out and you start asking people, well, I asked a young man last week, you know, are you going to heaven? You know, not in so many words, yeah. Are you, are you sure of your salvation? Well, yes. And why? Well, because I've, I try to do this, and I try to do that, and I, and I make sure I do this, and, and, and pretty much like in Islamic faith, well, my good outweighs my bad. Right? You know, and, and that's the, and I guess they missed the part in James, when if you broke one, one in as much as you broke it all, right? You just need to snap one link of a chain to, to make it fail. But, but that was, it, it's hidden from him. He doesn't understand. And I said, no, 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 that's not possible. Salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. He said, well, you know, yeah, you, you, you receive it by faith, but you have to maintain the works in order to keep it. I said, well, then you'll surely lose it. I mean, if you couldn't get the works right in order to get it, how do you imagine, you know, you're going to get the works right in order to keep it? I said, I don't, I don't trust that at all. I mean, I know me, I'm, I'm not going to make it. But it was, it's hidden from him, and he does not see, and he doesn't perceive, and he doesn't understand. Just like the Lord told Isaiah, what, go and tell him, see, but don't perceive, and hear, but don't understand, and you know, make the heart of this people fat and dull. And we have that same problem today. There's such a familiarity of Christ that we go around telling people the simple truth, but it's hidden from them. And they just don't understand what you mean. But it's by grace through faith and not of works and, and that you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to ask the Lord to open the eyes and to make the ears to hear and, and for people to believe and to understand. So that was the time, some 300 years or so, uh, that somewhere around 300 to 600, generally, I think is when Gregory came along, if I remember correctly, but uh, then there was the next church. And um, in verse 18, and it says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, he says, The Son of God who has, the, has eyes like flame of fire in his feet are like burnished bronze. That's an interesting way for him to describe himself. And it doesn't take too much time. If you go through judgment, you realize what he's speaking of. And flame of fire and burnished bronze... Uh, would refer to judgment. God's judgment. The fire of God judging them, you know. And he went and he said, but, uh, but, 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 but he went and he touched, you know, Isaiah's mouth with a coal. Like, what did he do? He purified his mouth by his judgment. And what did Isaiah said? Oh, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And what did he, you know, at Pentecost, what did they do? Like, a tongue of fire came down and it purified their speech to preach the word of God in purity and without corruption. And, and what happened? A great number were saved that day. And God's judgment does come through us for the purpose of refining us. He does judge us and he evaluates us and he tells you, hey, repent of that and let that go and change the way you think about this. But, but in terms of them, it wasn't in terms of their edification or their sanctification. He says, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. He says this, I know your deeds. He said, your, and your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than the first. It's really difficult for the Lord to address the church in this sense because he's talking to the masses. And he's really using the word the way we use the word today, church, tares, and wheat alike. Oh, well, the church, you know, well, yeah, are there unbelievers among the church? Yeah, there's a lot, you know, especially in countries like the U.S. where there's no consequence for being 
among the church. And he says, you know, but there's nevertheless, there are those, you know, like Mother Teresa among the Catholic Church, just wonderful saints of God who give and serve and love and, and they do all these things. And he said in verse 20, he says, but I have this against you. He says that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, I really don't know that her name was Jezebel, uh, but I, if I had to guess, I would think that he's probably wanting us to refer to the Old Testament Jezebel. You know, and who was she, and what is she like, and someone like unto that. You know, in, in, the, in the previous church, what did he say? He says, you know, you hold the teaching of Balaam. Balaam was not in the church of Pergamum, right? You understand, he, he pulled on the character of an old, the Old Testament character, right? Pulled on the likeness of that Old Testament character to illustrate what was going on in the church at that time. And uh, so those who don't like teaching out of the Old Testament, well, even God taught out of the Old Testament, didn't he? And he says here to them, he says, you know, he says, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, I believe it's very likely that there really was a woman there in the church. You know, if I remember correctly, it was in Thyatira that the women were meeting down by the river where Paul went and he had to find them. And very likely, but you know how common that is. You know, so often the, the women lead in Christendom so often. If you ever read the biography of, of uh, the Wesley boys, you find out that their mom was outstanding. Their dad was kind of a, you know, knucklehead. And you, <laughs> you find out what he did. And, and really, boy, if it hadn't have been for their mom, I don't know that they would have had the instruction, the upbringing that they did. But nevertheless, it creates problems when there's a void in leadership and whatever it may be. But who was Jezebel? Y'all might, she was a Zidonian princess that married Ahab. Y'all remember King Ahab. And y'all might probably remember the, the story of Naboth's vineyard and how one day Ahab, although he was filthy rich, was just moaning and complaining and belly aching, you know, that you didn't have that vineyard. You know, and it was just, you know, I want that vineyard. Jezebel's like, go get it. You're the king. You know, and she's like, no, leave it to me. I'll take care of it. You know, and so what did she do? She devised a, a manipulative plan. If y'all remember some false, false accusations against Naboth, and Naboth was, was killed, and, and Ahab took the vineyard. And so, uh, and if you, yeah, if you remember the account of, of what they did, but that was Jezebel, and that's the very thing that he was talking about here. He says, you tolerate this woman Jezebel, she calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my people, my servants astray, that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And really, what was Jezebel? Get what your heart desires. By whatever means you need to do it. I mean, get what your heart desires. You know, get, get what you want, and really, uh, hedonism, you know, you, and, and, you know Ahab, you, you want that vineyard? Get it. Get it for yourself. You're the king. You have the ability to do it. Nietzsche wrestled with that. He's like, man, if a man has, a, you know, the ability to exert his power to get something, isn't it okay to get it? A Superman idea, right, is what he called it. And Adolf Hitler took that, and he ran with it, didn't he? He said, that's a great idea. I'm able to exert my force over people, and, and, and I'll do that very thing. But you'll re remember what came into the church in this time. This was the time of papacy. And they came up with all kinds of ungodly ideas and thoughts, and not to mention the idea that, hey, you let us do A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, and you're good. And, you know, and it has to be us, and your salvation has to come through us. And, and, and then they came out with things like uh, indulgences and pay for penance. You know, well, ordinarily, you know, if you're a poor person and you send a lot, well, you need to go to confession and you need to, you know, say a lot of prayers and you have to go through all these. But if you're rich, throw me a hundred bucks and you're good, dude. Right? You know, you came in here, I know, well, Pastor Jeff, I, 
I cheated on my wife yesterday, and, you know, I've been cheating on my taxes, and, you know, I lied to my employer, and, you know, and this, and, you know, man, I tell you what, just, can you make a $5,000 donation, and I'll tell God you're good. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But that was literally the doctrine they had, had it's not even had, have, present. You can buy your way out of your sins. You can pay. You want that vineyard? Go get it. I mean, just whatever you need to manipulate, do to make it happen. I mean, you strike a deal, make something up. You go get what your heart desires. And, and really, that's the, the culture and the mentality that was created so much uh, in, in a religion like that. You know, go do what you want, say your Hail Marys, and go to confession and pay for penance and, and do your stuff and take the sacraments and you're good. But get what you want. I mean, go after the things that you really want. And, and he did not like that at all. He said, um, I keep losing my place here. By the way, I went to the doctor, the optometrist this week and you know, to get a new prescription, and we got halfway through there, and she says, well, she said, uh, things are going to be different this time, you know, and she said, look back at the board, and I look at the board, and she said, uh, you know, click, 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 read those lines, okay, she, she said, well, that's your far vision, and she switched it to another one, she said, now read that, I said, I can't, she said, well, that's your near vision, click, 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 can't, oh, I can read that now, she says, you know what that means, does that mean the B word? She said, yeah, bifocals. Yeah, you need bifocals. And I thought, oh, boy, you know. <laughs> you know. And uh, she says, all right, we'll give you progressives, you know, and you'll be all right, you know. So if I'm here in a couple of weeks going, you know, trying to figure out what I'm looking at, what I'm doing, it might take me a while to adjust. So I'm graduating to bifocals. I know a lot of you are already there before me, and but um, but it's, it's going to help. But... Uh, what did she do? And she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they what and so what is going astray? When they committed acts of immorality and eat things offered to idols and intermingled into and really uh, between Pergamum and Thyatira, idolatry entered into Christendom. And you say, Well, there's no idolatry in Christendom. Well, you'll have to exclude a couple of denominations. Because if you go over to Trader's Village today, you'll find booth after booth after booth after booth of just straight up idols. It's a little weird. I don't know how many of y'all have ever been in that setting before or know anything about Latino culture, but they're, they're farther ahead of us, you know, in their culture. And I mean, they're just straight up idols. This saint and that saint and whatever. And it doesn't even really have to be a saint. They've, they've started coming up with like Santa Muerte, you know, which is the dead saint. And it, it looks kind of like the Grim Reaper, you know, but, but you know, you get a little statue of the Grim Reaper and it's your Santa Muerte. And, and I mean, it's not, and don't think that this is silly, ridiculous stuff. You know, I actually had a man that worked for me that was getting his citizenship and he had to go back to Mexico for a couple months. And then he came back. When he came back, he had a, a little idol of Santa Muerte on his dash. And I asked him, well, ¿qué onda con ese? You know, what's up with this? And he said, oh, he says, well, he says, when I was in Mexico and I wasn't sure if my citizenship was going to go through, I, I made a deal with Santa Muerte. Serious. I mean, dead serious. In so much that, you know, weeks and weeks had gone by. And, and by the way, that man prayed to receive Christ on the job site one day and he threw Santa Muerte away. But <laughs> se murió. <laughs> Santa Muerte se murió. <laughs> That's what happened. Santa Muerte died themselves. You know, the dead saint died. But, uh, but uh, bringing in, I, you know, I, I guess we, we think that we're such a great population. Do you know how many Roman Catholics there are in this world? through Mexico and Central America and South America and Europe, even Africa. Through all of Asia, there's tons of Catholics. 1.2 billion, 1.2 billion that name the name of Christ. 
that fall under the umbrella of Christendom. You know, you think that there's idolatry among those who name the name of Christ rampantly. And it's not even like, you know, this in the United States isn't a good representation of it because if you go, I can remember, you know, I, I first time I ever really saw anything like this. I was in Chiapas, Mexico, and I was kind of up in the mountains, and I, and I just went for a walk. And I came up, you know, like on a, on a shrine on the mountainside. And it had a few, you know, ima- images, a few idols there. And they had the dead chicken also with its head cut off. And, you know, and, you know, but intermingled, you know, chicken sacrifice and, you know, intermingling these two things together, something that came out of really introduced, you know, people in the church to, hey, put this little statue up in your room. You know, have this little talisman that you wear. Un amuleto, you know, a little amulet or something like that. And, and putting, you know, uh, your faith into those kind of things. And God says, I, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And he says, by what committing acts of immorality and eating things sacrificed to idols. Verse 21, he said, and I gave her time to repent and... Uh, she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And so from this point on, we see the Lord now in the previous churches. We haven't seen him mention anything. But from this point on, he talks about the churches going into a tribulation. Now, not all the church, I mean... Uh, the, the, the true church is not going into tribulation, I don't believe. You know, some of y'all may not like that. The idea of a, of a rapture, I, I don't know why people don't like the idea of maybe they feel like they need to endure something. But, you know, you have to really put away a lot of scripture to believe that the Lord's not going to take his church before the great tribulation. I mean, over and over, and well, we, well, we can go through it. We're going to get there, you know. But... Um, as a pastor, that's what I teach. That's what I fully believe, and, and not because I feel like it. Scripture after Scripture, and you know, even example, even the outline of the Revelation of John, do you know that the church disappears in another chapter? It's gone. Why? Because John said, hey, come up here. <laughs> yeah, they told John, come up here, into heaven. And... Uh, but now that, you know, these are churches that, that are existing and, and still going today. And so he tells them, you know, hey, listen, you knuckleheads, imagine if you came here today to Calvary Chapel, Arlington. He said, hey, listen, y- y'all are doing great. Da, da, da. He says, but I have this against you. Some of y'all are this, this, and this. And he said, unless you repent, you're going to go into tribulation. Unless you get saved. Unless you believe on me, and I don't, I don't think he's going through, you're a good Christian, you're going to heaven, you're a bad Christian, you know. And, uh, he doesn't deal with us in that sense according to works. You know what our works do? Our works lead to our sanctification. Our response to God really controls how much we are transformed and sanctified and used of the Lord. That's what it does. It doesn't make you an ounce more righteous. It doesn't make you a single bit more loved by God. You can't God make God love you more because you're doing so good and, and all these things. You know, our obedience is for us. You know, like, son, help yourself. Listen to me and, and obey what I'm saying to do. But here he starts speaking of, of a portion of these churches going into tribulation. And, and who was it that's going to go into this tribulation? He says, uh, you know, I will cast her upon her bit of, bit of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. You stop and think, you know, those people among the church who are living out this rotten, godless life and no relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, you're going into tribulation. And he says, and I will kill her with the pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and will give to each of you according to your deeds. So he's the one bringing judgment, searching minds and hearts and then rendering each according to their deeds. Verse 24, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they uh, they call them, I place no other burden on you. 
He says, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. And I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, this is something that ought to be exciting to us in that the kingdom is not going to be, you know, sitting in a lawn chair 24 hours a day. You know, in I, I know some people say that it's going to be a perpetual worship service. I, I, I love that idea, but I think it's more than that. I don't think God just wants us to worship 24-7. Now, if you want to say worship and word and all you do, that's one thing. But I mean singing, you know. I, I don't think he wants us to sing throughout all eternity. I think there's, we have a, a God that's way more, more diverse than that. Think about even what he's appointed for us to do here in this time. We do much more than sing. We sing, we teach, we encourage, we exhort, we pray, you know, we witness, we, we do all kinds of things. You know, in the millennial alone, in the kingdom that it speaks of, and, uh, you know, some people aren't too sure, but, you know, the Scripture says in Thessalonians that when he returns, he's bringing those who have already died with him. You know, at least he's bringing their spirit then the scripture says, by, by, through Paul, it says that, that the grave, that the, the first resurrection, that they rose from the dead and they get to be united with their spirit. And then we also who remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. And, and so you stop and think, wow, well, that's, that's the, you know, getting us close to the millennial. Then we just have seven years of tribulation, then Revelation 19, and then we go into the millennial kingdom. And do you know that we get to rule and reign with Christ? Sign me up, you know, Lord, I don't, you know, I don't, whatever position he gives me, I mean, a job in the kingdom, a job for the Lord. Can you imagine if he was our infallible dictator and I am one of the government officials? You are one of the government officials. You have a job. You work for the king. You know, you go and you interact with the world. Hey, well, I work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, we got that 10-4. We understand. Please tell him to keep his rod of iron in Jerusalem, you know. We will behave down here, and they do for a thousand years, you know, and, and they do behave. But, but this is something that the Scripture teaches that we have an involvement in. What did he say? He said, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. That can be a frustrating thing for us because, you know, there's been a lot of saints in the last 20 or 30 years here in our setting, they get really frustrated. They want to see revival. Then they start to think something's wrong with them because they can't lead somebody to Christ. And, and they don't understand, you know, and, and they're trying so hard. And you have to understand that God doesn't put everybody in some wonderful revival setting to carry out what they... But He does tell people what you have, hold fast. Think about poor Noah. What did he have? An ark for 120 years. You know, how many converts? Noah, no, just eight. And they're my family, you know. You ever hear about that pastor that pastored a 10-member ten, ten church and eight were his own family kind of thing, you know, that, that kind of a deal? But that, that was Noah or Isaiah or Jeremiah. You're like, God, I don't have this great fruitful, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't born in the Smyrna church. God, we don't have this wonderful opportunity of, of martyrdom and great selfless service and adoration of you and, and seeing revival in spite of persecution. He said, man, you don't have to have that stuff. But what you have, hold fast. You know, what did God do? Did he make you, you know, a, a, you know, a custodian that specialized in replacing toilet paper bolts? Well, hold that fast and do a great job until he comes. You know, whatever it may be, hold on to that fast. It, we're never, the world never limits our opportunity to serve the Lord. I know sometimes we think that it does. Well, I could really serve the Lord if my setting was different. Nah. No, you can serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what you, if you live in the most ungodly, prosperous location, you can serve the Lord wholeheartedly. If you lived in the most horribly persecuted, impoverished place, you can serve the Lord wholeheartedly. 
I mean, it doesn't, you know, matter where you are in every one of these churches in every different situation, you know, what does he want each of them to do? Well, man, however you can serve and wherever you are in whatever capacity what you have, hold on to that and hold fast until I come. And he what? To he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. That here we are giving places of governance and authority and responsibility and I, you know, maybe that appeals to some people's power trip in mind, but I think it's wonderful because we know who the leadership is. You know, we know who we're working for. If I could dream of anything for our nation today, it would be an infallible leader and be wonderful to serve and wonderful to pay taxes to. But that's one thing that we don't have, but it's one thing that we are looking forward to. You know, we're not going to sit around on on clouds strumming harps there's going to be jobs and rewards and instructions and responsibilities and entrustments and you know identities in the kingdom and you know and significance meaning imagine if god just eliminated all meaning or purpose for eternity that would be mindless and a stupid thing that is not heaven that is not his reign. It's actually the fulfillment of all meaning and purpose. You want to make somebody miserable, you put them in a small little cell day after day to live out their life where they have no meaning or purpose. That's not God. Created for a purpose, created for a meaning, and not only in this life, but in the life we come, he has things that he has planned for us. And what did he say, verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as i also have received authority from my father and so his authority of course will go down maybe someday you might be delivering a message for the lord in the millennial kingdom and you come along with the message and you're like da -da -da -da. says who says the lord jesus christ <laughs> says him you know and oh never mind you know question solved you know problem solved and but that is the thing that we have to look forward to in him and he says and i will give him the morning star even my own self much better you know than than that we're, we're constantly looking for the things that god can give us rather than he himself and i get that as a dad you know uh, oh we had our little skit in here a few weeks ago, right, with Reagan. And, you know, here I am with the gift, you know, and uh, looking for the embrace. And she just takes the gift and takes off, you know. But uh, he gives unto him what? Even the morning star, that is the Lord. And uh, in that very personal relationship. And if we don't know, because really there's some people that, that, and I don't even really consider myself to have a great grasp on that. The, the value of an intimacy with him. We hear it like, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus, yeah, accessibility to him. You know, when we, when we blow something like that off so quickly, it's because we really are not that close. We just really don't get it, what that means. I bet that there is probably a person in existence, whether it's a loved one or a celebrity, somebody you really admire, that if you were offered the opportunity to have a personal and intimate interaction with them, you would be elated. That's my favorite artist. That's my favorite actor. Oh, I haven't seen my, I know people that haven't seen their parents or grandparents in 15 or 20 years because they're in this country illegally. And if they go to Mexico and back or Honduras and back, it, it'll cost them either 6000 or $10,000 between that they have to pay the drug cartel to smuggle them back across the border. And so they haven't seen them. And, and I, I've run into adult men that, you know, you sit down and you start talking about their grandpa and they start crying. Why? I haven't seen him in 15 years since I first came over here to this country. Why didn't you go back? I can't go back. You know? 
unless I have to you know, get smuggled back into the country again. Can you imagine if I told that man, listen, hey, I'll give to you your grandpa. I'll bring him here. <laughs> I'll put you in, in direct contact with him. You can have a relationship with him. And oh, don't you know how that would probably just light up that person's life. I, do, we, do we understand what we just roll off our tongue so easily and say, oh yeah, and I will give to him the morning star? Yeah, Jesus, I got Jesus, cool. And we go along. We don't, we don't realize. We, we have not given a proper appraisal or the proper use of the relationship. And I really, I'm almost envious of those I say it carefully. <laughs> Those people who have spent 10 or 15 years in a filthy prison in China. Those people understand the value of that. And they say that they understand the value of that. You know, they get it. And it's so hard for us to really get what that means. And Romans says it in this way. He said he who's given us his own son, and that's not exactly, but who has given us his own son, how shall he not also freely give us all things? In fact, it's like the, the chief prize of God to you is intimacy with his son through him. Intimacy with God through his son. That's the greatest thing that God has given us, and I think it's probably one of the greatest neglects that we just miss and we don't get or we haven't come into an understanding of, of what that hidden manna is. And uh, he says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so God be gracious to us to give us an ear to hear. And I'll stop there and we can continue with Sardis next week. But let's close in prayer. And then I think we have one more song. So... Father, thank you, God, uh, for your instruction to us, Lord. And, and I, Lord, I think the, the volume of this world is so loud in our hearts and our ears, God, that it's difficult, Lord, to hear the reality of the truth that you're saying to us and what's, what is and what's going to be. But Lord, we want to learn of you, and it's very difficult for us in this setting, God, because we're rich, and we're very deceived by that wealth, Lord, and so often we think that we are whole and complete and have need of nothing, but it's not true, God. We need a closeness to you, Father, and we need to be empowered by you, Lord, and and sent of you and called of you, Father, to be your witnesses, God, and, and to proclaim your goodness, God, and to receive power to proclaim you, God, among the world around us. And that's the thing we set out to do even today, Lord, as we make our effort, <clears throat> God, and as people go out for an outreach. Lord, I pray that you'd be at work in us and among us, Father, to teach us through your word, to lead us by your spirit, Father, to encourage us through one another, and God, to, to give us power to give glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.